Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. I'm here with Mr. Tom Endicott, chairman of the board for uh, <laughs> Team right. Endicott at Keller Williams. World um, headquarters. Yeah, that's right, the <laughs> worldwide uh, organization known as Team Endicott. So um, we're here tonight um, to talk a little bit about the current real estate markets, um, specifically right. here in the Indianapolis region, um, where, where we call home. Um, wanted to try to give out as much info and insight to, to all of you so that you can get a better sense of what the market's doing and, um, you know, some strategies you can, you can undertake to, uh, really take advantage of the market. So, um, Tom, um, we'll start, uh, with you, um, little intro to Tom. He's, he's been in the business a little over what, 30, 30 we'll years now. There. Yeah. Well, <laughs> uh, me. yeah. So Long story short, he's he he's been around a few times. He's he's seen several different cycles of of the business. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, anyone who's paying attention right now to to real estate um, really gets the sense that this is a very unique time uh, within our industry. So, for someone who's been around the business as long as you have, have you ever seen um, a market similar uh, to what we're facing right now? So we have in a different perspective. So from 07 to 12, we saw mm -hmm. it. And uh, Monique, can you go open that door and the door upstairs? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, so, you know, from 07 to 12, when the market tanked and we had no buyers, you know, that was a different story. Mm -hmm. So we were we were just clamoring with different uh, complaints. Hey, I can't find any buyers for my my set, my listings now right. is vice versa. We can't find any listings for our buyers. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and I remember my wife and I, when we, we bought our first home in Indianapolis, I mean, we, we literally had 30 homes mm -hmm. just within a few square blocks that, right. that we had, a, you know, literally the pick of the litter. That's right. Um, and now we're complete opposite. Yeah. Absolute complete uh, 180. We've never lived through it like this from a seller's market. And we're having, like we did our team meeting this morning, we, we're we having conversations like uh, our buyers are competing against 30, 40, 50 other offers. Yeah. And we don't see any signs of it going away. Yeah, I agree. So that's a sign for, you know, to, to look at that longer term is, you know, I'm going to wait till... Um, uh, the summer. Mm -hmm. Well, we, this is probably a two to three year problem sure. that we've got. Yeah. And, and there's, there's several factors for that too. So, and we'll, we'll dive into some of those here this evening on why that is that all the indicators that, that we're seeing and, and subscribing to are, are pointing to more of a two to three year uh, right. market, not, not a six month. Right. Um, and I, I get a lot of questions um, whether or not you know, COVID, what impact that has, you know, uh, vaccines, God willing, we're, we're, we're on the back end of this thing. Um, right. You know, is, is that going to have a major impact? And I think the long story or the, the, the short answer to that is probably not. No. Yeah. I mean, we, we did. You, you know the numbers. We, we were trucking along there in uh, January, February last year. And then all of a sudden, uh, COVID hit March, all the numbers they crashed right. hard. Um, and then after... But, but the buyers didn't. Mm -hmm. I mean, the buyers were still, the buyers still wanted to go out and look at homes. Absolutely. So we're out and gloves yeah. and mask and, you know, sanit because we didn't know the, the proper procedures at that point. Sure. So we're going out and doing that. Now, we still have some of those procedures, but um, uh, the, I think in general, right, wrong, and different, the market has basically said, COVID's not going to prevent me from buying or selling a home. Sure. Yeah. And me personally, I mean, I'm extremely proud of our of our industry our, our fellow agents mm -hmm. on the way we reacted to that situation you know yeah. basically a once in a lifetime type environment um and you know, we, we were able to still get out there and, and safely conduct business so yeah. and now today um we have different levels i mean it was shut down pretty much and you had to follow these COVID rules that were very specific you had a 30 minute window you couldn't have two more than two people in, or one set of buyers in right. at a time everyone had to have gloves yeah masks, it was, it was, uh, you everything. had to send over COVID releases yeah. um it's lightened up a little bit mm -hmm. and plus the it, we've, we're selling more homes sure I mean, well we have more buyers that's actually um, a problem that we have so it, it's the dreaded k uh procedure i guess for the camera purposes and do this, but, <laughs> the, um, our demand is doing this but our supply you know is kind of going down so right. we've got this huge gap so you know 30 40 offers is not uncommon yeah. which that we have never dealt yeah with. i i've I, i've spoken to folks who've been in the business even even longer than yourselves you. and 
<laughs> that number's getting smaller, but right. <laughs> <laughs> um, but but no, there's across the board everyone that I that I have you know had conversations with um, mm -hmm. has indicated that as well. So well, you know, uh, totally off subject, but um, with the, with our my porn numbers is totally off subject, but they're all incremental. Mm -hmm. So you know, if you started back with uh, Moses, you had um, <laughs> you know you had a one digit right my board number. Right now, today, I don't know if you got your number today. If you got your exam, I think you're around forty two thousand or so. Uh, I think you're you're into the forty thousand 40, range. 000, yeah, yeah, mid forties, I believe. <laughs> so, uh, and. I'm looking to see if maybe I can trade up. <laughs> so I'm not quite so dated. Right, right. You auction off your, uh, your right, four, your four that, digit number. Right. Some poor young sap that doesn't have any experience, I can get them a four digit number. That's right. <laughs> this guy knows what he's doing. All right. So I'm gonna I'm gonna make a note of that. Right. That's a new business strategy for us to discuss later. So So with the co the whole COVID thing is and and to back that up just a little bit, yeah, COVID impacted us, but I think as an industry we figured out how to get around that. Yeah, and very, very quickly. Clear. Buyers are not afraid of it. They want to go, and sellers, um, they're not afraid of it anymore. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, and, and I was just going to add to that. You know, the logistics of going out looking at a home, we we, we solved that pretty quick. Mm -hmm. um, the the other the, the transactional pieces, doing things virtually, e signature services. Yep. Um, I think is we, we were already going in that direction, but I think COVID is completely. Yeah. change that forever for us and um, i think we can do a lot more with the uh like we used to do the we did the matterport um uh home tours before COVID hit sure and, and the, uh, those are like the 3d where you can kind of click through the home right. and on, online uh, and virtual Monique's showings. giving me the signal what do you what do you give me question. what's the question are you seeing an increase in land for sale to build on Ah, ah, that's yeah, a good question. I, 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 I get that from time to time as well. Yeah, so we do see that because a lot of we, we we're seeing more demand for land, uh, but the amount of land is not increasing proportionally. So we're seeing yeah. a shortage of that too, and and it's not common. It's not uncommon for us to get uh, people who say, "I want to move out of my neighborhood. I want to live on two to three acres." The problem is, is that the land in our service area mm -hmm. to get a scattered lot. Yeah. Um, to be able to build on that, your so you drive by a sign and it's Lennar and it says you know we're in this neighborhood for two thirty starting at you know the low three hundreds or whatever. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's great. They have got the economies of scale together for um, uh, land development, sewer, uh, uh, soil tests, sure. all that stuff. Sure. It, it it is very very hard right now to build on a scattered lot. Uh, for under five or six hundred thousand dollars within uh, a reasonable distance of, say, Fishers or Carmel Absolutely. or Noblesville. Yeah, if if you get a little bit further away from 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 the center of Indianapolis, um, the that price starts going down. Yeah. But again, the it, there's a lot involved with buying a piece of land and, and building a home on it. Yeah. Um, and, and you so, mentioned several the the the, the pre work that goes into that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, just overall um, land, I think is there's a shortage of that for sale, just like anything else right now. Yeah, we we talked to some people down in Brown County um, over the last three or four months, and um, the number one, it, it's being desired by people locally, mm -hmm. but they have experienced a huge uh, rush of people from Chicago. Yeah. That are coming all the way down to Brown County. Uh, to buy land and to either build their primary resident mm -hmm. or to build a cabin. Sure, That's and vacation home, yeah, second home. They can't get enough land down there. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, across the board, it is it, it uh, land has a shortage also, and then trying to get the builder on top of that. Mm -hmm. So you got to think a little bit further down the line on that. So so that's a great point because the builder's time frames now are so so stretched out yeah. um you know again a lot a lot of reasons for that uh, material shortages um mm -hmm. right. th them just backed up with so much uh, available work that you know it what would have taken we'll just say a six month process is now you know taking 12 18 months sometimes we did um we did a doc last month we put her under contract and typically you get a closing date at contract that's you know, uh, end of August, 1st of September, you mm -hmm. know, that kind of window. Um, her window is September, October, November. That's literally what they wrote into the contract. Wow. And they won't stick you to it right. or they won't, they will not adhere to that. They have language that says, if we can't hit that, we're not in breach of contract. Sure. <laughs> so, and then you've got the lumber prices, all the material costs are going up too. So right. building everything is just going up. So yeah, it's, it's just uh, an unfortunate 
you know, aspect of, of our reality right now. So we do probably, I don't know, 12, 15 houses a year. We help people build. Mm -hmm. And uh, for the first time ever in my career, we had buyers that are ready to go build. Yep. We called um, a builder that we thought would be a good fit for them. And the builder said, come back in three or four they, weeks they to talk. They, they won't even talk to you. Yep. yep. Yeah. Right. And, and we, we've talked about that. I think we both have experienced that yeah. where the big production builders uh, that we see around town, I mean, they're, yeah. they're, they're stomping the brakes on us even being able mm -hmm. to sit down and have a conversation with them about our buyer purchasing yep. a home in one of their neighborhoods. Yeah. So. so those, those, uh, for those types of things, those relationships become uh, valuable because we can talk to, uh, I'm not trying to sell here, but the, sure. when, when you have a, an agent that does that, they can kind of get in with those builders to talk about what's coming down the pike. Absolutely. Right. So not that you get a tremendous advantage. I don't want to overstate that by any means, but you know, we know who's got what coming down the pike. Sure. We, we, we can't get an unfair advantage on it. No, but, but we know about it. We, we know about it. Yeah. We, we can leverage those relationships yeah. to our, to our advantage. So, yeah. um, so that let, let's talk a little bit, you know, talking about builders, um, mm -hmm. they have a big hand and I'm not pointing the blame by any means at builders. Um, but, that that's that's a main reason or one of the main reasons why we're in this kind of a yeah. climate right now so that's right uh, you've done a lot of research on this um certainly more well versed at it than i am so talk well, a little bit about that on uh on what the what the role of new construction is right uh right to our environment that we're in so where we are what we're doing right now is we're paying the piper for 2007-2012 mm -hmm. so it, back in that timeline um, the economy was headed down a little bit. Um, the housing market started to tank. And then when it all just went south quick, builders stopped. Right. They did. They stopped building. Uh, builders went under. I mean, there's neighborhoods that you and I can talk about where builders went under and, and they had all these lots that were still un, unbuilt. Mm -hmm. And other builders would come in. And then you had the conflict between, you know, they were building a, a $400,000 house in it. The builder went under. And now some other builder came in, bought the rights to the land, and they're building a, you know, a, a $200,000 house. You had that yeah. going on. But the builders stopped. They they canceled all their options. They stopped building. They condensed. They they withdrew. And, and this is when basically buying just came to a grinding halt. Grinding halt. Yeah. And so they, they did not have I, a consumer. Their consumer base completely gone. fell out. Right. I would have yeah. done the same thing. Absolutely. But now, um, trying to get geared back up to it, uh, the last number I saw was that we're roughly about 5 million, maybe 5.5 .5 million homes short nationally. Mm-hmm of where we should have been, you know, 07, if we would have continued this curve, you know, like this, of, but we didn't, we did this and then we did this. And right. now we're, now we're trying to catch back up to this. We've got about a $5 million, a 5 million uh, home deficit yeah, that we're sure. trying to make up. Absolutely. And that's why you've got these uh, unbelievable times with uh, the builders as far as uh, lead times, build times, uh, mm -hmm. supply chain, all of it. It's yeah. Just, it's it, crazy. It, and it was just, again, the complete opposite of what we're experiencing right now where, everything just completely dried up on, you know, on their business front. And they basically, just like you said, they, they had to cease what they were doing yeah. and the ripple effect that that had long-term on the, on the industry. Yeah. We're still feeling that today that, yeah. which is quite remarkable that a, a small window, when you think about the overall, you know, scheme of things, uh, just a small couple year window, mm -hmm. how that affects us you know, right. 10 years later. Yeah. We're still feeling the, the, the impact of that. And we just, we just had no, we, we didn't, we didn't think about that. Right. I mean, up until the last two years we had supply and mm -hmm. it was, we were going pretty good. Another question. If I buy in this market, will I be upside down when I go to sell in five to 10 years? Great question. Yeah, so there, there's several factors there. We can talk inflation. We can talk yeah. um, appreciation. Uh, so the you know there's, there's almost a little bit of a graph on that, but in general, our market traditionally, history historically, has enjoyed a three to five percent appreciation rate. We're just we're kind of slow. We just kind of hum along in our market. Mm -hmm. Now we're doing this. So the question is, okay, well if we do this, we're going to do that. Right now, the indicators that we have think I, I I don't think we're gonna go from this to this. Right. I think what we'll end up doing is going from this back to this. Mm -hmm. So the short answer to the question is is that the crystal ball question that's being asked 
is that we think that you will continue to grow, but you won't grow at the same rate. Maybe not the right. not at the same clip, right. but still continue to grow. Yeah. Um, and it, I think something important also to consider is when you look at our market compared to other cities of our size. So I think of the Austin, Texas of the world or yeah. uh, Nashville, Tennessee. Um, you, you see their values and their home prices compared to us. And we're, yeah. we're, we're still quite you know, just a tremendous bargain yeah. uh, compared to some of these other marketplaces. And that's, you know, that's part, the, the bargain part, we can bring it up a little bit later if you want, but mm -hmm. um, we did a listing last week. We had, we only had 12 offers, by the way, you won yeah. the, uh, the I, 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 I guessed 11 ahead of time 11, and it right. was, it was we, 12. So we did a, <laughs> uh, in a, a team um, uh, prices, right deal with that. Uh, but out of the 12, seven of them were major companies outside of the Indianapolis market that were buying for um, investment purposes. They were hedge funds, mm -hmm. um, investment companies that were buying from that standpoint. Okay. The, the problem that that creates for our buyers or our local buyers is that when you, when you put 12 offers in front of a seller and you've got a cash offer, no appraisal, that is fifteen twenty thousand dollars over list price mm -hmm. compared to say a first time buyer that is putting uh, three percent down or three and a half percent down that's going to have an appraisal that is a rough gig it is a rough gig. it's a rough gig mm -hmm. so um that's the type of market we're in right now and the competition we have there and we're not going to beat how to make our offers look better all the time. Sure. Yeah. That's, that's a separate but conversation. But that's what sure. we're the, nationally, um, the, the, the investors of the country think that the Indi Indianapolis market is um, uh, undervalued. Agreed. And so back in 07, there were two companies, um, America Homes for Rent was one of them mm -hmm. that was initially came in. And as a list, as a buyer's uh, a listing agent, when I would have a listing come in, we would literally go seek out those sales reps that were local to say, Hey, here's a listing. Does it match your, is this what you're looking for? Right. Sure. And, and they would buy it. And that was our, that was it. That was it. And we all thought, man, they're, they're going to kill themselves. Now there's no way. And now they look like geniuses because right. they've got 2007 prices and they've been renting them for all this time. They are making a couple bucks. And they've just added to that portfolio to year over year. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. And it, it's, it is a tough market for buyers, um, but like you mentioned, there there are strategies, there there are opportunities there um, for them to be competitive. Yeah. Um, you know, and we we can certainly talk about that another time or one on one yeah. with with anyone watching. So. There's strategies to make it happen, and mm -hmm. and I, if I'm a first time buyer, I'm not giving up hope in this. Mm -hmm. um, oh, absolutely. That's not. probably yeah. another question we can have. But do, do we have another question? Uh, yeah. Uh, with low inventory, are you seeing buyers foregoing home inspections mm -hmm. to try and make their offers more appealing? Yeah, so that 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 is a fantastic question. Yeah. So who who asked that one? Yeah, my husband. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Smith asked that. Yeah, great, yeah. great question, so, Aaron. There, there's what's happening, mm -hmm. and then there's what we think is um, maybe not being a good decision. I agree. Yeah. Right. So from a listing standpoint, we do get um, those types of, of offers, mm -hmm. no inspection. And But we should clarify, uh, there's three, when, when you submit that offer, you mm -hmm. have three options as a buyer, right? Correct. Okay, so you can waive the inspection, you can do uh, a traditional inspection, and you can do a as-is inspection, as is, right? Yeah. To, to, when people hear those, they hear things that are different than what they mean what, what it actually is so right. so let's talk about that so yeah. waiving and inspections that, yep. that's the first block that you can check yep. in the offer that's under right. the inspection uh paragraph yep. waving is we're not doing it it's we're not even going to talk about it yeah if you uh, do the, the inspection it doesn't matter yep you, you you can do an inspection all you want we're not but talking about it there's no no conversation we're to be done had. right there's no deadlines in there there's nothing mm -hmm. so and, and then the second one is Hey, we're going to do an inspection, right? And when we get the results of that, we will present our findings to you. If there's anything we need to settle uh, or resolve, we'll we'll have that negotiation and, and right. work our way through it. Traditionally, that's that that's what we typically see. That's what we typically see. Um, then the third one is as is addendum, right? Um, and we're seeing a lot more of those 
um, you know, yeah. over the past few months, I we would are. say. And the buyers, the, the, the problem with the as is, and there's a lot of conversation in our industry right now on how this is presented. There's a timeline in there for, um, a, a, there's a, a blank uh, to put in there how many days the um, uh, the buyer has to do the inspections. Mm -hmm. But the, the, the concept is, is that uh, they're trying to communicate to the seller that, we recognize we're, we're going to buy the house as is, but we want to make sure there's no huge problems. Sure. I mean, that's, that's kind it's of fair. the intent of it, right? It, it, absolutely. All right. So the, but the way it's being used is, um, uh, which means let's back up. So what that means is, is um, I buy your home. Mm -hmm. All right. And I have uh, Monique come out and she inspects it and she gives me a list and lo and behold, um, the furnace um, is emitting carbon monoxide. Yes. All right. So we won't go into the definitions of defects, but I think we'll all agree that that's probably that's defect. something that needs to get resolved. Right. All right. Mm -hmm. So now the as is addendum says that I, as the buyer, can say, mm, "Don't like that. Don't like that. I'm, I'm out." out. Yep. Okay. And, and it really um, is because we don't have a black and white playbook of exactly what a defect is. Mm -hmm. And as a former owner and manager, and going down to um, naughty court. <laughs> All right, to my board court to, to define these things. The buyer has, it, it, it's really what the buyer defines as a defect. The buyer, I shouldn't say it that way. The buyer's perception of what a defect is, is going to override, uh, is going to have a, a heavier weight than what you think is the seller. That's right. In general. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now we, we have this furnace and, and I'm out. Well, what's what they're doing is they're using that now to potentially get out of the offer. And this yeah. happened to me last summer. Yeah, so I, I, I think, yeah. it, and I remember that. So the the intent of it, of the as-is addendum is, hey, we're not gonna fix anything as sellers, but you're more than welcome to do an inspection. And if there's anything um, major that's that's mm -hmm. wrong, you can you can back off, you can right. back away, walk away, and right. you know, shake hands and part friends, right. as they say. Um, but that's actually now working in reverse sometimes against the seller. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's, that's. Yeah. It, so it, from a, from a listing agent standpoint, mm -hmm. um, I prefer to have the traditional, I, I, I waive it. Okay. If I can get a, a, a buyer to waive their inspection from a listing perspective, as, mm -hmm. as a buyer's agent, I'm not going to recommend that you do that unless you're an investor. Absolutely. So, so real quick. So waiving an inspection as a buyer, you can still have an inspection. Now, the difference between that and the as-is addendum is the as-is addendum says if you find any major defects, you can you can walk right. away. Right. With waiving the inspection, I mean, it doesn't matter what's wrong. You're you're locked in on buying this property. There, right. There's no walking away right. uh, without forfeiting earnest money and you right. know, potential other liabilities. So. That's right. So from a listing standpoint, um, well, from a buyer's agent standpoint, I will call the listing agent and have the conversation about what as is means and what we intend with it, if that's what they prefer. Some listing agents still prefer the list, the, the as is. Mm -hmm. um, my perspective on that is it, it gives the buyer an out. So what I'd rather see from a listing agent standpoint is I'd rather see a traditional because what the traditional inspection says is you can do your inspections in your timeline, but then you have to give me the opportunity to fix it. Absolutely. That's yeah. the big key. You can't just walk out. As is, I'm out. Mm -hmm. I don't like that. I'm out. Gone. Right. So with the traditional, you have to afford me that opportunity to make that repair. Mm -hmm. And then I can say no. If I say no as the seller, then you can walk. Then you can walk. Right. right. But at least that way I've got from a, a seller, I've got the opportunity to, to fix it and make it go. And, and, there, and there's creative ways there uh, between both parties to to come up with a solution, mm -hmm. you know, to that problem, yeah. uh, different negotiation tactics, different things you can do to, to yeah. get that accomplished. So last summer's deal was where the uh, buyer found another house that came on the market that mm -hmm. they liked better. Mm -hmm. So they used the as is to get out and we were cuffed to it. That, and, and <laughs> when those offers came in, that was the only thing on that offer that we reviewed as the seller said, mm, don't think I like that. Right. But we didn't counter it. Okay. And we lost that. We lost that deal. Mm. Lesson yeah. learned. Lesson learned. Come on, Mister Indicott. <laughs> right. Right. Get some experience. <laughs> yeah. So, um, w with that being said, um, what what would your recommendation always be when you're representing buyers? Yeah. Uh, do an inspection. Not do an inspection. So, um, the, it, there's not a one size fits all. Mm -hmm. um, if I've got a home that was built last year, mm -hmm. I'm probably a little bit more comfortable with that waiving. 
Mm -hmm. I'm probably going to make, you know, what we call our reconnaissance call to the other agent before we write the offer. Sure. We're going to call that agent and we're going to say, hey, this, how do you feel about the inspections? And do you, what, how do you consider um, uh, an as is versus a traditional? The other thing that we've been doing, as you know, is uh, maybe we do the traditional, but we waive any petty um, yeah, nickel and dime right. stuff. So you put a yeah. dollar figure in that says, okay, anything under five hundred dollars or a thousand or twenty five hundred or whatever. Right. Whatever that number is, um, that we're not going to negotiate. So that that sends the signal to the seller. If I get one of those, I like those because it sends the signal to the seller that, hey, we're not going to nickel dime you. We're going to give you the opportunity to fix anything that may come up that we'll find. Mm -hmm. And then we're all working towards getting towards a closing and nobody's just going to walk. Absolutely. So, yeah. And that, that's ultimately the goal. So it, it's agent to agent, though. I think that's the big key is you, you got to have your agent as, as a buyer, your agent. You need to make sure your agent calls the other agent about the inspections to get their perspective on it. I agree 100 yeah. percent. So yeah. so it, that there's. There, there's that piece of it, the inspection piece. Um, I, we get those questions a lot. Um, you know, there, there, there's certainly other things buyers could be doing mm -hmm. right now to be competitive outside of inspections. Um, yeah. um, we don't necessarily need to go through step yeah. by step through, through each one of those, but ju just overall, so, so some of the things that are obviously important ahead of time before you even get out there and start looking um, from a buyer standpoint, yep. what are some things that they should be doing to really get all their ducks in a row right. so they, they can be as competitive as possible? So uh, a lot of the things we're seeing now is uh, you, you're trying to make your buyer look as solid as possible. Mm -hmm. All right. So part of that will come down to the lending part, which I think you're, you're kind of hinting towards. Yes. And more and more of the lenders are getting deeper and deeper into the pre-approval process for... and. And there's a difference. Be, we use, we throw around pre-approval pretty right. liberal. Yeah, it's pretty pretty loose. Yeah. yeah. Um, and there's a difference. Uh, most agents won't take the time to figure out the difference. Yeah. But, you know. And you're talking between pre-qualified versus mm -hmm. truly being pre-approved. Yeah, yeah, right. Correct. So some lenders do a better job at that than others. But the, mm -hmm. the, the more, the farther you can get down with uh, your pre-approval process with the lender as a, as a buyer, and then you, you're, you can communicate that to the listing agent. Um, you come across as a better or a lower risk mm -hmm. to a seller. Sure. So that's definitely a, a, a path. And, and most of the, I shouldn't say most, many of our, uh, many of uh, mortgage lenders now are, they're pushing that. Absolutely. Before yeah. they, be, be, because they want, they want to make sure it gets done. Yeah, we're, we're, we're typically taking a little bit more time before we even go out and start shopping just to work through all those those mm -hmm. pieces um, so that when we do eventually go out and start making offers on properties, we know we're, we're, we're absolutely rock solid right. um, as far as our buyers are concerned. Right. So um, speaking of lending, that's actually a good segue. So the, probably another question that we get asked quite a bit has to do with interest rates. Yeah. So that's a big driver right now with the number of buyers in the market. Yeah. Um, so... We're, I, I, well, I haven't and, seen... And you get two questions on that. Okay. Number one, you get, um, should are in, what are interest rates going to do? What are they? Yep. Okay. What are they and what are they going to do? Mm -hmm. And number two, you get the, the buyers that say, and the sellers that say, well, I think I'm going to wait two or three years until this calms down. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, okay, well, great point. They, they say that and that's like, they don't know they're talking realtor code. Mm-hmm. But to us, we're looking at going, well, we don't know what the interest rate's going to be in two years. Agreed. Yeah. Yeah. So right now we're at historically low levels yeah. with, with interest rates below yeah. 3% for the most part. It, yeah, it, they, give, it hovers around 3%. Yeah. yeah. They so let's, a little bit. Let, let's say that. Um, and it, it's gone down and it's ticked back up a little bit. But I think somewhere around 3 is a safe uh, safe area to, to talk about. Yeah. So um, super cheap money as far as purchasing mm -hmm. a home is concerned. Um Throughout your time in the industry, have you seen interest <laughs> rates go this low and, and essentially remain where they have been now for what over over a year now? I feel well, like, you know, they are. Years. And and really, okay, well, we won't do the old when I started the interest right. rate was twelve and a half percent. Right. Right? Okay, we won't do that. But the um, you know, back ten, let's see, two two administrations ago, so um, you know, back in the Obama years, the the interest rates started coming down. Mm -hmm. They got competitive, there were incentives given. And they've been, you know, they've been doing this a little, you know, two, three, four, you know, in that range. They're starting to tick up. Mm -hmm. um, 
if you follow the market at all, the volatility in the market, um, the VIX is kind of one of that I follow, mm -hmm. um, that the market's getting nervous and it's tied to uh, the bonds. And I had a conversation with Brad earlier today. He gave me the, uh, the, the quick update on how that goes, but it, it used to be that the treasury, the 30-year the uh, uh, interest rate was tied to um, a, a longer term, a 30-year treasury bill. Okay. And you know, ten, now, because the mortgage industry has figured out that most people only keep their inter, their mortgage for like seven Six, years. Seven years on yeah. average, yeah, on I think average, it is. Right. Sure. So they figured that out. So now there used to be, you, you could get like almost a full point difference between a 15-year mortgage and a 30-year mortgage. Yeah. Now it's, it, it, it went it's, from, it's super, close, right, yeah. super close. And, and that, that's, that's actually a, a great point that, I, I don't know that you and I have actually talked about that before, but you know, I think about back when I was a child growing up, it, it was common that yeah, as if it was, <laughs> I'm dating myself a little bit here, but no, the, the, the common thing was, you know, my parents, my friend's parents, they all had the house, you know, and all my friends grew up in the same house and right. their mom and dad, some of them still live in those same homes. Mm -hmm. uh, one of my best friends back home, his mom and dad still live in the same home that I was going to when I was in sixth grade. Right. Um, you just, you don't see that quite as much anymore. Um, and and the I, new generation. yeah, the, the newer generation, it's every about on average, every seven years they're, mm -hmm. they're selling their home and buying something it, new. And, and that number is a weird number because, um, the older generation, they're still there, mm -hmm. but the younger generation, they're moving more often. Sure. The average length of time is still increasing, mm -hmm. but the segments are two definitive segments. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, it, it just. Yeah, that, that, that was an interesting point that you made just because, you know, I hadn't really thought about it in those terms. So, um, so, so on the interest rate, right. when the buyers ask, should we wait two years or three or whatever? Mm -hmm. What I always do is I, I just bring up Google, uh, a Google search mortgage calculator and the Google mortgage calculator pops up. It's usually got an interest rate that's a little bit higher than what it is. So sure. I think Google's got a little something going on for right. <laughs> Uh, but then we just play with that number and we say, okay, if I'm going to borrow $200,000 today at 3% and, um, and we're going to go with interest rates between three and a half percent. And I promised Brad that I would say that that depends on down payment and credit score. Right. All right. So there I've covered my back end. <laughs> um, but you take that and you say, all right, today it's, let's go with three mm -hmm. principal and interest equals this. All right, let's just say in uh, another six months, it goes up to four. and another six months, it goes up to five. We're just going to do a 2% swing. Okay. All right. And you're going to live in that house. You tell me you're going to live in that house for 10 years. I'm going to put my kids in school and I'm going to, I'm going to push them through. Or this is, okay. So we do 10 years. The amount of money that you pay more for a higher interest rate, it comes out to like a free car. Yeah, it's, it's it, a it, big it, number. It adds up really quick. Right. Mm -hmm. you, you don't think that interest rate makes a difference. So, so in addition to that side note is that if you own a home and you don't know what your interest rate is, mm -hmm. you should look it up. Yeah, you absolutely should. And if it's not down by 3% or so, that is an opportunity to refi mm -hmm. and you can refi right now with um, zero. I mean, yeah, basically it's, zero, it's free. So some folks are getting money back. Money back. Yeah. Right. Um, and um, I'm not even talking cash out refi. I'm just, right how it works out. Yeah. So, so it, you know, sellers go check your interest rates, be okay. financially sure responsible. But then from the buyer standpoint, you have to play that game of if I wait to buy today, number one, uh, you know, we're again, we're probably not doing this forever. We're probably going to get back to this a little bit. We don't mm -hmm. expect this. And I want to come back to this in a minute, but based on that, if I wait two years, the house that I wanted to buy for three hundred thousand is now three fifty, yeah. right? And my interest rate is now is now four, five or yeah, four, four and a half, right? sure. So yeah, yeah you kind of you, you kind of shoot yourself. It, in the it wasn't out. that long ago where if you could get something below five percent, that was that was a home run. That was a home run, mm -hmm. right? Right. So on, I, I want to hit this just a little bit on, okay. on a downturn. We the market does this. All right. But we just in general do, you know, we just, we do this. Mm -hmm. If will I try to time it as to when I'm going to buy, when it's not going to do the impossible. Right. Can't do it. Yeah. 
I mean, if we could do that, it, it, we would. Be yeah, doing I'd, else. I'd be living in Jeff right. Bezos' land. Right. Sure. <laughs> right. right. <laughs> so we just know that in general, our trend goes like this. Okay. And can I make um, can I make a, a couple extra bucks in a year? Maybe. Mm -hmm. Will I lose a couple bucks if I try to sell by the time I you know pay expenses? Maybe. Mm -hmm. But in general, we're this. Absolutely. Um, will we do this? We did in 07 and 12. That was an economy issue. It, it was. Yeah. So there, I think fundamentally there were yeah. different things at play that mm -hmm. cause, um, you know, the issues of those times versus right. what we're experiencing now. So, right. um, so that's, and, and a lot of it's almost polar opposites, you know, the, it, that's right. And that's know. where I wanted to talk just a little bit about that in that some of the key things we felt like unemployment. Sure. So last time I checked unemployment was 6.3. Right. Right. We, you know, COVID, we had the COVID unemployment, mm -hmm. but now we're coming back to that. Uh, we're coming back to where we we're not down at three and a half where we were, mm -hmm. but we're, we're at that six in general, the gurus I talk to say that 6% is kind of the health. That's the yeah. green, that's the, like the Goldilocks. That's like, you're not great, but you're not bad. Yeah. Everything, Everything is just, just kind, kind of kind firing of, along and, right. and chugging along. Right. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's kind of where we're headed with this, uh, with our unemployment. Um, and the interest rates are low. The problem we had back in 07 and, and, and 12 is that we were already, the economy was doing this and it was not a uh, pandemic induced uh, problem. Yeah, it, it was actual it was fundamentals of, fundamental of the problems, economy right. itself. So that's why we don't think we're gonna do this. We think you know we'll, we'll kind of do this. Mm -hmm. that's, that's where we are. Yeah, mm -hmm. and, and it's also, I think, fair to say that the fundamentals were also being affected by some of the things going on in the real estate industry. So that, yeah. um, you know, just exacerbated, I think, an already, you know, bad time. So yeah. that's not really at play right now. So, yeah, um, yeah so overall, um, you know, citrus percent, you know, everything's looking pretty good. All the, mm -hmm. all the trend lines are showing that improvement to continue yeah. into the foreseeable future. So yeah. when you're, when you're talking to a seller, even a buyer that says, Hey, we're going to sit on the sideline for, for two years or a year mm -hmm. and, and, and wait, really that, that could be, you know, sh you know making a short term decision that that's actually going to have some negative consequences yeah, long term. Mm -hmm. So let, let's talk about that because that's, th there's some other things going on right now. I think that we get questions on of, should I do this? Should I not do that for both buyers and sellers? Usually from the buyer standpoint, we're seeing more buyers willing to forego some things like inspections mm -hmm. or, um, you know, the amount, the amount over list price that they're offering. Yep. Um, what are some things that, that you're seeing right now? Some of those short term concessions uh, that, that really long term is yeah. not, not yeah. a very sound decision. That's, to be a, making. that's a, a good it, question. And, and from, you know, it's a, uh, I, I'm enjoying this role from a, a fatherly standpoint, right, right at this point, but, <laughs> but the, um, you know, you, you look at your kids and you're like, don't do that. Yeah. You know, I know you want to do that. Right. Don't do I that. I know you love that house. Yeah. But so you go in and you show buyers a home and, and it's it's been flipped. Mm -hmm. Okay, I don't have anything against flipping, but what they flipped was the carpet, the paint, the trim, and the countertops. Lipstick on the lipstick on the pig. On the yeah. pig, right. Yeah. And then you look at the roof and it's at twenty years old and the furnace has got the installed Ugh. with Moses is the name. And right. you've got um, you know, all the windows are you know, they they shake when the door you got all these big ticket items and oh by the way it um, sets on 146th Street, right? Right. <laughs> sure. So you know that conversation with those buyers is I, I get that it, it's pretty, but today it might be the only house on the market. That's right. But when the market balances out, which the it will, it will. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it's a two year, three year, five year, ten year, but it will balance. When you go on the market, and it's not a seller's market like yeah, this. Yeah, you're you're yeah. back down here. Now. So now we have 25 of these homes mm -hmm. that the buyers get to pick from, and yours has got 146th Street running through it. You're going to the bottom of the pile. That's right. You're so, you're going to lose your you know what on it uh, when the time comes. We want um, we encourage you as a buyer. We encourage buyers to think longer term. Absolutely. Just and it takes patience, and we we have such a I want it now type mentality. Mm -hmm. But the uh, you you've got to be patient, and make that decision. Yeah, uh, and I, I think some of the examples you, that you gave were were spot on. You know, flip property that I I you know do plenty of that and see plenty of that, and 
I can usually tell within five minutes whether or not it's, it's a quality flip. Right. So to me, there, there, there's a big difference between a rehabbed property versus a flip property. Okay. Um, and that, that's just, that, that's my own personal way to kind of, right. kind of separate it. But to, to that point, yeah, if you're walking into one of those and it's got, you know, beautiful granite and new floors, but a 20 year old furnace and, you know, old wiring and things like that. Yeah. They, they didn't do their due diligence yeah. on, on this thing. So it, it really starts with those items first and then works its way out to the things that you actually see. Yeah. So, yeah, we'll um, see that. What, what, what about, so th that's, that's kind of more of the extreme, but what about the, the beautiful home and the beautiful neighborhood, you know, in the beautiful school district that move in ready buyers love it. It's in their price point. And they just, it's so, far, it's, so good. It's the unicorn, I'm not right? hearing the downside to this. But <laughs> there's also, we know there's going to be 15 other offers on it. So, uh, yeah. so there, there's only so many things that a buyer can do mm -hmm. to really kind of stand out from the crowd other than just backing up a, a Brinks truck with money to the garage and unloading bags of cash to the sellers. <laughs> you know, um, what, I, I, I share <laughs> you, this. You probably have a story for that. Well, <laughs> it, it's, I actually, last summer I got bribed by another agent. Um, you they, did. You yeah. absolutely did. Yeah. I remember that. Yeah. Um, you know, I, that information, we don't have to talk about who that was, but. No, um, but it's, yeah. do share. It's, yeah. it's quite the story. Yeah. So. <laughs> they, they, yeah they, they, all the offers came in and I got this call from the state and said, hey, is there anything personally that we can take care of? Yeah. Make can our I, offer look can, better. Can I do something that yeah. benefits you? Yeah. So. Like, no, we don't. We don't do it. Absolutely. That and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that here in just a second about some code of ethics and what you should or shouldn't be doing. But um Go, going back to the buyer side, I feel like that's the biggest question I get is, Mike, what can we do right now to, mm -hmm. to get our offer, you know, seriously considered and looked at? Yeah. Um, we've talked about inspections a little bit. Um, a lot of times it's come down to purchase price. Um, yeah. So list price is almost the starting line right now. So well, I, And list price, in addition to that, is comps. The comps. Mm -hmm. Right. So you're a buyer and you say, okay, well, it's listed at uh, three three hundred. What do the comps show? And and the comps show two fifty, two seventy five. Right. Okay. So what are we gonna do with that? Yeah. How much higher can we realistically go and we this do? thing appraise? Right. Um, so you've got you, you, the the comps are out the window today. Mm -hmm. I mean, we'll show them, but yeah. six months from now, when the comps catch up in the database, right? It, it'll it'll it, be more reasonable. It about out. Yeah. Um, you know, one of the other things I saw uh, happening is the covenants and restrictions. Mm -hmm. All right. So that's one. Um, those are pretty easy to obtain. Sure. So you can get those, give those to a buyer, have them look at those ahead of time, and then don't make your offer contingent upon covenants and restrictions. Yeah. Um, uh, what uh, floodplain, if you know it's not in a floodplain, write that off. Don't, 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 don't do, do it. it. Yeah. Um, what you're going to use the home for, you know, unless you're going to use it for something other than living in it. You know, there's no reason to put any timelines in that checkbox. Right. So basically what you're saying is eliminate as many contingencies as you can, yep. um, you know, to, to benefit the seller, I suppose. Yep. Um, and, it, and I guess to some, some respects, not really benefiting the seller because the buyer doesn't have any intention on, on doing anything different anyway. So that's right. Um, right. So it's just, it's just clearing a, a checkbox off that it now, you know, it had a mark in it. Now it's clean. Yeah. We don't have to worry about and, it. And clean is the right word. And that's, yeah. we use that a lot in our, our business. So um, we try to make our offers as clean as possible mm -hmm. when we submit them. Monique, it looks like we, we might have another one. So what does a buyer do when an appraisal comes in? Oh, yeah, the, the dreaded, uh, we the, got a okay, low appraisal. So, yeah, the, the question is, is uh, what do we do when the, uh, what does the buyer do when the appraisal comes in low? So, so let, let, let's frame it, let's say, <laughs> first of th all, th th let, let's get some context. So <laughs> let's say they're, they're under contract on a home at 250000 Okay. The appraisal comes back at two forty. So yeah. there's a $10,000 yeah. gap. Uh, between yeah. appraised price and purchase price. Uh, you know, what does that mean? Well, I, I, first, I don't think we're allowed to hire hitmen for right. the appraiser. <laughs> for think, the appraiser. So that's not an option. So, right? so. <laughs> we love appraisers, but they, they can be the bane of our existence right. sometimes. Yeah, they, most of them, the, 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 we've got appraiser friends, and most of them are struggling right now like we are, mm -hmm. You know, because they feel the pressure of knowing that the market is increasing, and they're working with the same comps we are. Right. But they're held accountable for theirs where we're not. I mean, here's the comps. They don't mean anything. What do you think it's worth? Sure. You know, that kind of, that's our mentality. Their mentality is they got a bank that's looking at them grading their appraisal mm -hmm. and their income is dependent on that. So I give the appraisers a hard time, but they're, they are in, um, they are in a, a very tough situation. They, they really are. Yeah. Um, so what, what, in that yeah. situation, a buyer, what, what do you do? Yeah. So you've got, um, you've got a couple, two or three options, right? Okay. 
Okay. So first, let's make sure we understand what the purchase agreement says. Great point. Right. So the purchase agreement right under the line that says, I will pay $250,000 for this house, says that if an appraisal is done and the home does not appraise, then, then the buyer is not obligated to buy it and the seller is not obligated to sell it. Correct. So basically all bets are off. So either side can technically walk right. away in that, that right. situation. And the lender, of course, the lender's looking at it saying, well, I'm, I'm going to either lend you your loan value. So if I'm doing a, a 80% loan to value, I'm going to loan you 80% of either your um, appraised value or your sales price, whichever's lower. Right. So right? in this case, the, the, the appraised price is the is lower, lower of the right. two. So, so the they're, answer, they're basing the loan then off of that, no. not what you guys offered on the property and got accepted. Right. Correct. Yep. So the, the, uh, uh, so what you do about that, you have a couple options. Now, up until the last, I don't know, four or five months, mm -hmm. we would uh, try to negotiate that. So we get that appraisal. Uh, we, we offer to, we, we get an accepted offer for 250. Mm -hmm. The appraisal comes in at, 240. 240. So we're 10,000 off. So we, maybe we had asked for some closing costs. Maybe we have negotiated some repairs. Maybe, mm -hmm. you know, so we had some things that we could play with after an accepted offer. So we might say, you know what? We knew, uh, we negotiated $3,000 in repairs. Uh, 1,000 of which was, um, um, I don't want to give an example because I might just a thousand dollars was one thing. We'll say, don't worry about that one. All right. Sure. So seller, you're now good a thousand dollars. Um, so now we're negotiating nine thousand. We'll bring three thousand dollars to closing. Now we got this. Okay, so there's you would negotiate that down. Mm -hmm. Today in today's market, what's happening is when you get a, a an offer that you get 10, 15 offers. And by the way, at our sales meeting today, we talked to one of our agents had forty nine offers. Forty nine forty nine offers on, offers one, on home. one property. That's right. right. So what the listing agents are looking at for there is they want to address that low appraisal issue up front. Uh, immediately. Immediately. Because every, keep in mind, every, not, I, I shouldn't say every, but the majority of offers right now are at or above list price. Mm -hmm. And I would say it's becoming more and more common to be above list price, mm -hmm. not at list price with your offers. Yeah. Um, so right off the bat, as a listing agent, I'm yeah. looking at that. It, same house, $250,000 house, you could offer me a half a million dollars for it. Unless it's cash, it doesn't really matter. Right. Um, because we know it's not going to appraise for that. Right. So what do we do? Yeah. Um, so we can do the, um, uh, we guarantee a low appraisal and that has a big degree of risk. It does. Right. Yes. So what that means is, is if the, you write into your purchase agreement, if the home, uh, the, the buyer will bring X number of dollars in addition um, to what we intended to bring to cover a low appraisal. So in this case, um, we, we, we know the house that we're, we're going to offer 250 mm -hmm. and we put into our purchase agreement, um, buyer agrees to bring $5,000 and additional funds to cover any low appraisal. Mm -hmm. All right, great. So if the, if the home appraises at 245, Seller, great. seller's great, right? Yep. Buyer has to bring five thousand dollars extra. This is where it gets really tough, and you know, I have this conversation with my wife and with other people that, okay, I've got an investor that presents a letter with no appraisal and has um, all cash. All yeah. cash. I yeah. actually the largest pre-approval uh, uh, proof of funds I've ever seen two hundred and thirty million dollars in the account. Mm. Okay, I, they're going to cover a low price. Right? I think that that covers it. Yeah, right. right. Yeah. So they, um, so that it is tough to overcome that, but whatever we're able to do to cover that appraisal, mm -hmm. that is probably the, the, the best thing you're going to be able to yeah, do. And it's going to be, you know, situation dependent, both yeah. on the home and, and on the buyer uh, and on the seller too, probably to some yeah. degree. So um, with there, there's certain what we're kind of terming as gap coverage, appraisal gap coverage, yeah. that we're starting to have those conversations very early on with, mm -hmm. with our buyers. Some buyers, do you have the you know financial yeah. ability to to bring some extra cash to yeah. to make up a potential low uh, low appraisal? Some, however, don't. Yeah. Um, so for those who don't, it becomes even more important to put forth as clean as an offer as you possibly can. Right. Or try to go find some some other avenues to find a home outside of that move in ready home in the perfect neighborhood that yeah. that twenty buyers are lined yeah. up out front of. And you know, um, you know, the, the problem, and this is, I, I don't want to say it's a moral issue, but it's one that I struggle with is that, 
you know, out of those, the, the 12 that we had, seven of them being investors, there these other people are homeowners. They couldn't buy that house. They couldn't buy it. Right. I, I agree. They didn't have I, the ability. To I, I had, I had a seller one time that exact same situation. Um, we received a couple of those portfolio investor type offers. Yep. And the other one was a first time home buyer. And it was like a $10,000 difference. Mm -hmm. And bless her heart, but they accepted the the first time home buyer because they, they looked yeah, at me and they're like, Mike, this I love my neighborhood. I love my neighbors. Mm -hmm. I'm not selling to some some corporate, you know, right. investment firm that now has a stake in this neighborhood when I could sell to this awesome, mm -hmm. you know, young couple that, you know, may yeah. or may not have, have a child yeah. on the way. So And they there's um you can write, we have to be very careful with writing letters and pictures because yeah. of the um, familial status ethics that we have to abide by. Mm -hmm. But there are ways to try and connect with the seller to tug at their heartstrings to maybe work with us. Yeah, for right? sure. So, yeah, yeah and there, there's different techniques and strategies with that that, that we can dive into. At a, we call it at a stalking, but that's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a whole different yeah, topic. Yeah, digitally stalking to some degree. Yeah. Um, so, so, code of ethics. So that, that's, well, or, the, the other one, before I get to code oh, of go, ethics, go I'm watching our time, is okay. this. is I wanted to talk from, and I guess it does tie with code of ethics, but from a seller standpoint, okay, what's the best strategy? And I know all kinds of sellers that I'm talking to, they're getting letters in the mail. They're getting na yes. neighbors knocking yes. on the door. Hey, I've got a buyer for this neighborhood. Will you let me in? So my question to you mm -hmm. is, uh, or you know, the thought process is, is, is it to a seller's best interest to, if, if Monique sent out a letter to our, you know, to uh, the neighborhood, I mean, she's an agent and she says, Hey, I've got a buyer. And, she comes in and she says, yeah, we'll offer you um, $300,000 for your house. Mm -hmm. Is that in my best interest as a seller? <sighs> Typically, no, it's not. Right. There, there's, certain, there, there's certain situations where it certainly could be, but I, I would say um, as a whole... It, yeah. it, it's not because the because it's, there's a the market you're 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 basically putting the market on the sideline and yeah you're you know, letting one one person determine your price absolutely so and we have, and, and, and I hesitate to to blank you know put a blanket mm -hmm. no on there only because there could be those times where the offer is so good that yeah. you know yeah we can't turn that down or there might so, be terms in, in it so uh, maybe. Um, maybe you've got a health issue and you don't want people through the house. Sure. I mean, there's, there yeah. are, there's, there's instances, but overall, mm -hmm. um, letting the market percolate for you as mm -hmm. a, um, um, as a, a seller and to see what comes in. I mean, we're getting crazy, crazy offers yeah. and terms. And then from a, a listing perspective, we're able to negotiate all the, all, we pick and choose out of each one. Hey, your offer said, um, uh, you're going to waive the inspection. Great. Your offer said you're going to cover uh, $10,000 in appraisal. Great. So then we go back to the buyer that we want to work with for whatever that reason is. And we mm -hmm. say, Hey, by the way, you're leading the competition, but we have a couple of deficiencies that we need to discuss. Sure. Yep. Right. And, and you're we, basically taking the best out of all the offers mm -hmm. and going back to that one offer yeah. that you, you know, you really want to work with for whatever reason. And really trying to combine all that into a counter offer. But if you only have one offer, if you only have one offer, sure, <laughs> right. <laughs> that, that's a different. That's you a different have, scenario. You know, that option. So yeah. in general, um, we think it's a better uh, strategy to let the market work for you from a seller's perspective. Yeah, it's, absolutely. It's crazy. Yeah, because and that that's a great a great point because when you're when you accept um, you know one of those type of letters and you're you're talking to an individual buyer. Um, there's really is no leverage right. moving forward beyond that initial offer. I'm going to put the house on the market if I don't. Get yeah, yeah, yeah. Right sure. We. <laughs> um, do we have any other questions, Monique, that I want to cover? No. Okay. Um, I also want to talk. I get Go this ahead. question a lot too. Yeah. Um, what about distressed properties? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so. so we're we're seeing um, we're we're seeing those come back around full circle. So. Um, you know, and, and that's something I know as a team, you and I have had a lot of discussions about, and I've been, you know, diving headfirst in, into that marketplace. Not to stress physically. Okay. Financially. Oh, whole different conversation. Whole different, see, right, see right, I, sorry. I, talking about words have meanings earlier. <laughs> I hear distressed property. I'm thinking. 
There's the flipper the, the, in mind the, right the, there. The ugly house in the pretty neighborhood. <laughs> you're, you're talking distressed property, distress from the standpoint right. of a mortgage. Mor- right. Mortgage. Right. Uh, they're unemployed because of COVID. And they, What's the now, difference between the 2007 market and the distressed uh, financial properties mm-hmm. and uh, today? Uh, today, I think it's, it's, it's kind of going back to what we were talking about earlier. It's what's driving that distress. Um, in 2007, it was just a complete falling out of the market right. and the industry as a whole. Right now, that's not the case. Um, and, and the other point with that is if I am uh, behind in mm-hmm. my, if I'm delinquent. It, 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 great. I know exactly where you're going, but go yeah. ahead and finish the thought. Yeah. yeah. So, um, I can now, I, in today's market, the values are doing this. Mm-hmm. Where in 07, they were doing this. Yeah, people, so in, in 07, people were absolutely desperate to try to get rid of their property before you know the, the bank foreclosed on it. Mm-hmm. Most of the time, they were unsuccessful in doing that. Now, if, if you're, if you're a, a, a homeowner in a situation where, for whatever reason, um, you need to sell your property and sell it quickly, otherwise the bank's going to come take it, I mean, great time to put it on and, and probably yeah. pay off your mortgage and walk away and with, make with money. money on, Where on in 07 it. through 12, it was, your value was doing this yeah, and you, it were was, a, you were spiraling you, down. You, you were selling your property for pennies on the dollar yeah. at, at that point, where today yeah. that's just not the case. Right. Um, All right. So then we'll finish that with um, there are not very – people here, I want to look at foreclosures. Sure. I want to look at bank – there just aren't many of those they're, they're, in our area because the, the prices have done this. People can mm-hmm. eject and still make money. Yeah. Okay. All right. So then um, your distressed property. My – when I hear thinking, distress, right? yes, I, I'm <laughs> exactly. hearing something different. So <laughs> distressed property that I was alluding to just a moment ago um, – you know, the, the ugly house in the pretty neighborhood or the okay neighborhood, the, the home that for whatever reason needs updated, you mm-hmm. know, it, it needs a, a makeover for her, right. for a lack of a better word. So um, there are mortgage programs out there for buyers, especially first time home buyers, even uh, there's FHA products or conventional loan products mm-hmm. that will allow them to not only purchase the home, but also roll in renovation costs right. um, into a single mortgage. Um, and that is that is something that I think so many buyers are underutilizing right yeah. now. Um, because, and, wh- and why is that? Uh, yeah. I have my own opinion, but I'll, uh, we'll ask. Yeah, I, I, I think I, I think there's some misconceptions. Mm-hmm. Um, I think a lot of a lot of folks believe that hey, if I'm gonna buy this home, I need to come out of pocket a hundred thousand dollars to fix it up. Um, I, I think there's also an entire generation that's grown up now watching Chip and Joanna and, and HGTV is I, I love them too. And you see the numbers that they put on the screen, you know, <laughs> right. you, you have a $150,000 budget to buy it, but then your renovation budget is also a hundred thousand. Well, what they don't really tell you is all that's being financed usually, yeah. not yeah. always, but, but usually. Yeah. Um, so I, th- I think there's a lot of that. I think the other hesitation is a lot of buyers don't know where to begin. Mm-hmm. Um, who, who do I hire? Um, you know, am I going to get raked over the coals by a contractor? Are they going to take half the money and, and right. split halfway through the job? So there, there's all those stressors and, and anxiety. Um, the key to all that, though, obviously, is is putting yourself, you know, with the a professional team that, you know, is going to be there for you and be yeah. able to get you to the finish line on a project like that. My answer rolls down those lines in that the FHA 203K mm-hmm has been around for as long as I have. Yeah. I, in all my years, 1,700 transactions, like one You, you don't time, have, you don't see people don't, utilize it. We don't them. use it. Yeah. It's, it, nobody understands it. There's, there's companies that come in and claim they've got it, but then it's complicated and, mm-hmm. and nobody knows how to navigate it. Yeah. And because our industry in general, there's niche markets, but mm-hmm. they, they don't understand how that works. But it, it, there are products now that aren't just that product that yeah, can make so, it work. So the FHA 203K mortgage is, is the one that most people are familiar with. Mm-hmm. There, there's some other Fannie Mae, Fetty Mac products. Uh, right. or, or, or I say Fet, Fetty Fet, Mac. Yeah, I was going to let it go. <laughs> <laughs> Freddie <laughs> Mac. Thank you. Yeah. Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. Um, <laughs> there, there, there's some, uh, there's the choice, choice uh, renovation mortgage. There's the home style mm-hmm. mortgage. Um, the, those those type of things. So, and you're absolutely right. So, w- going back to the the FHA 203K mortgage, that's typically the most common that we hear about when yeah. when you're talking about these type of properties. 
there are certain things that have to be done. Um, it, it's a higher threshold uh, administratively uh, to get one of those deals right. across the finish line. So you have to work with a lender who's well-versed in two or three K mortgages right. um, because they're not just lending you the money. They're going to lend you the money to buy the home, but then they're also lending you the money to fix up the home. So right. money has to go into escrow accounts and then we need contracts with contractors in you know, scheduled draw payments made at, you know, at specific mm -hmm. periods in the project. Um, and it takes a lender that knows how to pull all those strings to make it work. Right. Conversely, it also takes a general contractor who understands yeah. the FHA 203K process because that contractor also has additional requirements paperwork wise and verification wise and inspection wise um, mm -hmm. that you wouldn't typically see if you just hired someone to come redo your kitchen. Right. Um, so there, there are different. There, there, there. It's more, it's more hands on. Um, it, it's certainly a little bit more time consuming. But in a market like this, if you're a yeah. buyer that's struggling to find a home you want, let's go look at some ugly homes and let. <laughs> let I mean, I'm I don't safe. Think you're allowed to say that. Yeah. Right? Uh, we're getting the we're getting the cutoff right. We, okay, we so. can do that, and yeah. we we can get you the home that you want. So, yeah. um, and I say we just in general. In general, right? Yeah. All right, so uh, two things then. I want to make sure that if there's any questions, this is our first go at this, yeah. having these general conversations. So if there's any topics that anybody would like to have covered, just put them down in the, am I pointing the right place, in the chat? In the <laughs> or, comments. In the comment <laughs> section, right. Okay, put them in there and we'll uh, we'll uh, roll out a different uh, program for that. And then uh, I do want to thank Mike for coming over thank and you, uh, taking care of uh, uh, running through the questions and answering questions. We had a beautiful fire here. Yeah, but we did. We, it got we, so hot. We were sweating before we even went live. So uh, our fireside chat is uh, really not so much fireside. <laughs> and, and we want to thank Monique for uh, figuring out how to get us on, on Facebook. So, all right. Have a good evening. Thank you. Thanks, guys and gals.